Today's presentations on the overview of nuclear graphite R&D um, in support of advanced reactors presented by Dr. Will Wines. During the introduction today, Dr. Patricia Pavier. Patricia is the group leader of the Radiological Materials Group at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. She's also the National Technical Director of the Molten Salt Reactor Program on behalf of the U.S. Department of Energy. And she's also the chair of the Gen 4 International, excuse me, International Forum Education and Training Working Group. Patricia. Good morning, everyone, um, and good evening. Very happy to have um, Dr. Wines with us today. He's a material scientist and a direct fellow at Idaho National Laboratory. He has over 35 years experience in extreme materials research, with the majority being in nuclear materials. His materials interests range widely from solid oxide fuel cell development to space nuclear propulsion systems to spent nuclear fuel issues. However, his focus for the past 20 years has been in the areas of nuclear graphite and carbon-based composite materials for the new high-temperature reactor design. As the Advanced Reactor Technologies Graphite Program Technic Lead, he has overseen the large advanced graphite creep irradiation experiments at INL, developed one of the largest unirradiated nuclear graphite material property databases, and he is the current chair in developing the SME Graphite Code, has numerous interactions with the NRC, international organization, and commercial HDR vendors on graphite-related issues. Dr. Wines holds a doctorate in material science from the University of Idaho and a master and bachelor in nuclear engineering from University of Illinois and UC Santa Barbara, respectively. So without any delay, I'm giving you the floor. I uh, will thank you again very much for volunteering to give this presentation. Thank you, Patricia, for that kind words um, and, and introduction. So let me see if I can give put my screen up. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we do. Thank you very much. Okay. Again, thank you for that fun, kind introduction. I did. Um, I am Will Wines. I'm from the Idaho National Laboratory. And before I begin, I want to make sure that you understand that uh, all the funding that was and, and the hard work that was being done was kindly provided by the DOE uh, Advanced Reactor Technologies Art Program in contract with the DOE Idaho operations under Patel Energy Alliance. So you've seen this. Before I begin, I wanna make sure that um, I acknowledge all of the hard work that uh, the team uh, that, that we have here and at Oak Ridge has done. Um, all of the information you're gonna be seeing today pretty much has been assembled by most of these folks. And so, uh, these are the true experts and uh, these are the expertise uh, that they they represent in the the graphite community okay so as i as you saw i wrote a provocative title i had a hopefully informative and amusing uh, abstract but today what i want to try to talk about is to inform you of course but also to entertain you just a little bit as far as the graphite um, world in the nuclear graphite. So what I'll be doing, how do I do that? I'm gonna have to give you an understanding of what makes graphite graphite. Uh, we'll have to get into the details a little bit, not too much, uh, as far as the graphite crystal structure and the, and the microstructure. Um, we'll talk about some of its unique characteristics, uh, specifically irradiation and oxidation, and then some speculation. Uh, some of the interesting irradiation mechanisms that we're discovering uh, nowadays, some of the um, underlying issues with the oxidation and why graphite cannot and will not burn. 
this is a sort of a personal crusade on my part and hopefully I can convince you of that. All right, so why am I here? And why are you here? The main reason is because of the nuclear renaissance. I think everybody's heard of those, especially the folks in the GIF. Um, so since about 2000 or so, it's basically referred to the possible nuclear power revival. And this started out with rising fuel, uh, fossil fuel prices, but it's transitioned um, and rightfully so to limiting greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, it's a fantastic way to eliminate the fossil, uh, the carbons from the fossil fuels. But that's the driver, right? That's why we're, we're, we're the economic reasons that we're trying to do this. The reason it's a renaissance is because, in my opinion, is that we are now, after many painful years, we and many painful lessons, we are now ready to start the next generation of, of reactor designs. Uh, primarily, these are the next generation because they have natural shutdown and cooling from design. And because of these new designs, you now have new uses. You can use actually the process heat nearly directly, small modular designs, a variety of coolants and fuels and different ways of using. So the new uses are what's going to be really interesting for the next generation and next stage in the evolution of nuclear power. Now, I just want to make sure that people understand this is not just in the United States, the EU, or China, or any other place. This is worldwide. There's more than 70 advanced reactor projects worldwide under development under all of the different gift flavors uh, that, the, um, that, that we've been promoting. So as you can see here, there's quite a few, and it's all over the, the, uh, the world and the globe. I tell people that this is, uh, the Renaissance is here. And this is a slide that I, I like to put up. Uh, this is from actually my, my boss. Um, what this is, this is specifically in the United States. Um, and what we're seeing here is in the next four to five, well, excuse me, five to six years, these are all of the reactors that are projected to be built. And as you can see, Many of them are going to be prototypes, but there's a few first builds in here. So in and even with the prototypes, it's real fuel, it's real new designs, and they're going to be operating. So before the decade is out, we're going to have not one or two, but multiples in the United States even uh, only. You're going to see these new designs that are start, going to start popping up. So it's extremely exciting because it is really here. So why are you, why am I talking to you? Why am I talking about Brown? Well, one of the highest technology ready design concepts is the very, or high temperature reactor design. And what this is, is, is um, a high temperature reactor design, which uses graphite as its primary structural component in the, in the reactor itself. It comes in two flavors. As you can see here, the prismatic on the right-hand side, where you have long stringers of fuel that are suspended in the moderator, much like the light water reactors. However, the fuel, of course, is carbon-based and it is surrounded by carbon or graphite instead of water. Um, the coolant channels go down through the, the half the holes that you see on the on fuel block there, and uh, it it um, operates much like the light water reactors, except for it's just very high temperatures with a solid moderator and reflecting. The other design on the left is the pebble design. This is a really interesting design. It has been around for a while, hasn't really been uh, perfected in engineering except for in Germany. But it is a very interesting concept in that you take graphitic based fuel pebbles that are the size of a tennis ball, and you drop them in from the top. They move through the uh, reactor core, and then you come, they come out at the bottom and spend fuel. The common material for all of these is synthetic graphite. It's a structural, it's required for the uh, structural components and the safety envelope of these elements. Without this structural graphite, you're just not going to be able to go in and have this 
uh, very high temperature reactor to uh, kinds. Let's see. I don't understand why I'm having a problem with advancing. There we go. All right. So when I say high technology readiness, why? What am I talking about? Well, as you can see here, uh, we already have graphite cord reactors in um, operation as we speak today. And we have plenty of, of experience in this area with these other designs, starting from the re uh, Dragon Reactor in 65, all the way over to what we have now in China as the very first graphite cord uh, high temperature reactor, the HTRPM. So this is a uh, high technology readiness uh, reactor design is ready to go and there's plenty of people that are working in this area as i said the renaissance is happening now 20 years what happened about 20 years or so ago which was nothing more than government funded r d projects that's evolved into numerous commercial enterprises worldwide so these are just some of the people that i work with on a near daily basis and they are all uh, graphite based cord uh, reactor designs. Uh, there's a wide variety of different coolants that are being concept or that have a concept, not water in the high temperature, sorry, uh, that's just for the Gen 4, uh, but different coolants, different fuel types and sizes, small modular and micro reactors, even up to large convention. So, as I said, graphite's important. It's basically um, one of the first Gen 4 designs that are going to be built. In fact, it already has um, with our um, partners in China in this um, endeavor to, to, to get the new next generation. So, <clears throat> as I said, this is going to be um, one of the more important materials, both currently as well as in the future. Okay, so that's graphite. Uh, why it's important. Hopefully I can give you an understanding of that. Let's talk about graphite. So what is graphite? You just basically take a bunch of carbon atoms, you stick them together in a benzene-like ring, and then you uh, attach those together into what we call this graphene basal plane or a 2D chicken wire type structure. You then stack the planes, graphene planes on top of each other in an ABAB stacking and voila, you have a graphite structure. Um, what's interesting is that the there is covalent bonds within the basal planes in the C-axis direction, and then there is weak van der Waal, or most people say van der Waal, but it's actually electronic bonding between the basal planes. So what does this do? This gives a completely anisotropic structure. If we were to take a piece of graphite, single crystal graphite, and make graphite components out of it, it would be completely unusable. The material properties in the C-axis direction are dramatically different from the A-axis. As an example for the CTE, it's 25 to 26 times uh, expansion in the same temperatures in the C-axis direction with the weak bonding direction than it is in the strong bonded covalent. A axis direction. So what do you do? Well, you make a composite. And that's what synthetic graphite is. You take perfectly good graphite and you grind and chop and crush it up and, and, and size it into the pro proper sizes that you want. Then you glue it back together with a carbonaceous binder and you then form it into a final billet that you want and then bake it out. But the the, the area that you really want to focus on is the graphitization. It's the last step. You need to graphitize at 2200 degrees Celsius for graphitization to actually to occur. Uh, most grades are heat treated up to 3200 or 3000 degrees C uh, to accelerate this graphitization process. So as you can see uh, from the microstructure from synthetic graphite, um, it's this is the, a, a synthetic graphite that's the uh, microstructure synthetic graphite showing the three phases of the graphite microstructure. You have the filler phase, which is the chopped up coke material, your graphite, your binder phase, the glue, uh, and then you have pores. So 
Nuclear grade graphite is about 20% porosity. The pores and the pore structures absolutely define the response of the graphite. And the pore size ranges are nanometers to millimeters. And before anybody asks, why can't we go in and, and, and fill these pores in? Can we make the graphite more dense so it's more strong and has better thermal properties? The answer is no. We do not want to do that. We must have pores in graphite, nuclear grade graphite. It gives us the um, response that we expect and rely upon inside the reactors. Um, more accurately, we must have accommodating porosity. And we'll get into that in just a minute. So when I talk about the pores and the size range, what am I talking about? Well, these are down at the crystallographic uh, link scale. So these are four to five nanometers at the tips. You can see that they actually go down. This is um, cracks, uh, Rosowski cracks, and we'll talk about that a, a little bit later, uh, down inside the crystal structure. Uh, the grain size link scale, these are larger grains at the, at the um, micron, hundreds of microns and millimeter uh, link scales, and even inside the components. So what you're seeing here rotating on the left is a pore structure inside a current grade of graphite that we're taking a look at. Uh, it's about a couple of inches or uh, centimeters as, as uh, the rest of the world uh, talks about, and it is through crack. So basically we have connectivity between the pores, even between these even large components that you see in the middle of the slide. So when you're done with all of that, what do you have? basically a near isotropic material which has extremely high thermal stability greater than 3000 degrees c graphite's not going to melt it's not going to have any kind of problem so long as you keep a little bit of the uh, graphite without any oxygen it will oxidize has good high heat capacity high thermal conductivity those gives it its nice uh, behavior and performance in the reactors and it's a pretty decent reactor uh, core component it's not perfect, no material is, but it has a pretty nice re irradiation response and predictable behaviors. Uh, it does oxidize at all te uh, temperatures, but it does not burn, and we'll get into that here in just a moment. I do want to say one thing before I go on to the next slide, which is that there really is no nuclear graphite fabrication standard. We would love to have something like the uh, metals have, where you have an alloy that you can pick for your specific application and have a reasonable understanding of what you're going to get. Each grade of graphite must be qualified before it can be used in these applications. All right, so let's get into some of the, the degradation behavior. So we'll start with oxidation. Um, so because of the pores, remember the pores are key, Air and oxygen can diffuse into the uh, microstructure. You can therefore have in, uh, oxidation from the inside out. And what's interesting is that it is very temperature dependent, but opposite what you would think. So for the same mass loss, what you're seeing here on the uh, charts um, is that if you have the same mass loss, but you've oxidized at lower temperatures, you can have lower strength because of the internal than if you were to have the same mass loss at higher strength. This is simply because the chemical reaction rate is so high that at high temperatures, you're only oxidizing the very extreme edges of the components, whereas low temperatures will allow oxidation to occur internally, leaving lower internal. Uh, or strength in the components because of the internal mass loss. So it's it's an interesting phenomenon of behavior, and it's opposite what most people would think. Why? Well, basically because ox uh, the oxidation only occurs on these edges, the armchair or the zigzag sites. The main reason is because the covalent bonding inside the graphene planes is so strong, you're just not going to tear those bonds apart. It's only going to occur at these reactive surface area sites, the RSA sites that, that you see here. 
as a consequence, it naturally limits itself to a chemical reaction. There's not any kind of way you can sustain the reaction, therefore no fires as a consequence. All right, let's talk about the irradiation behavior. Now, um, this is a bit, bit, bit of a busy slide, but it's all related, so it has to be put together in this, re in this regard. Graphite actually densifies under radiation at first. And so what you get is the graphite components will actually change their dimensions and shrink, if you will, densify one, two, or even up to six, seven percent over the initial radiation. They then stop and then they volumetrically expand. So <clears throat> after what we call this turnaround point where you have the densification stopping and then volumetric expansion. And what you can see is there's a direct correlation to the strength of modulus with this turnaround point where the graphite stops shrinking or densifying and then volumetrically expanding. You don't see that very much, uh, that direct link with the CTE, um, but there it is, um, um, it follows the, the turnaround point. So the CTEs change uh well thermal expansions change will follow the turnaround point if it's farther out in the dose um, and this is obvious because when, as you start to densify what you're doing is, is you're closing down the cracks making the material stronger and stiffer and when you stop and start to volumetrically expand what you're doing is creating cracks the only thing that doesn't seem to follow this is the thermal diffusivity. Now, this is because the me mechanisms for thermal diffusivity are happening at a length scale that's really not related to the, directly to the larger pore structures. This is at, at an atomic length scale, so these are point defects. And so what you see is an immediate drop in the thermal diffusivity with a slow, steady um, decrease as you increase the, the dose for the graphite components. So I'm not going to talk about the strength or the, the uh, modulus or any of the other ones. Those are fairly well understood. But I am going to talk about the radiation dimensional change because this is the life-limiting mechanism. If there is no accident with all things considered. This will give you a change in the uh, dictate the, the lifetime of your graphite components. So what's going on? The graphite, as it shrinks, is putting tremendous stresses internally, as you can see here on the right. And then as it, when it stops, um, because, excuse me, because it's dose dependent. So the, the fuel facing or neutron facing portions of the components are put into compression, but the material away from the face are not. So this puts a lot of stress on the, um, just inside the, 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 the components facing the, the neutrons. This continues into the component as dose increases until finally the forward facing components start to volumetrically expand. Well, meanwhile, the rest of the internal part of the component is still under compression. This puts tremendous amounts of, of internal stresses inside the, the graphite structure. And you see these cracks forming after the turnaround point inside the graphite. And this is well represented from Garrett Hogg's excellent work with the ATR2E graphite. So what's happening? Well, this is what we think is going on. It's, it's, this is the, the current model, as you, as you can see. A neutron comes in. And there's a ballistic event uh, where uh, atoms are displaced from their atomic lattice structures. Uh, the interstitials fly off, and then, of course, they end up in the lowest energy wells, which in many cases, of course, would be the weak electronic bonds between the basal planes. They're not going to be breaking covalent bonds. The leftover vacancies cluster together into a cluster, uh, vacancy loop. Then what happens is, is that... <clears throat> As you can see, what happens is the interstitials cluster together and they start to form these subplanes between the, the um, existing basal planes. 
the vacancy clusters will get large enough so that then you can have vacancy collapse. And that's shown in this, these cartoons here and even on this day, uh, cartoon at the bottom left. The crystal, crystallites will shrink parallel to the basal planes during the vacancy collapse. But of course, they expand uh, perpendicular to the, to the basal planes. So you may be saying to yourself, okay, that's great. That may explain the dimensional changes, except for one thing, one problem. Why are we not seeing expansion uh, if it's happening at the same time? Well, that's what's very interesting because graphite, be as it's fabricated at well over 3000 degrees Celsius, the thermal expansion, as you recall, is 25 to 26 times more in the C-axis direction than it is in the A. Even when you cool it down to normal reactor operating temperatures, you're going to have the basal planes form these defects, the Rosowski cracks. And these form small accommodating porosity that's inside the crystal structure. So that under irradiation and damage, when the crystallites start to expand in the C-axis direction, they expand into these Rosowski crack volumes and you don't see it. The only thing you see is this dimensional change from the vacancy collapse, which is shrinkage. So this explains why you have this original dimensional change or densification uh, shrinkage at first. Why does it stop? Well, the accommodating porosity is filled up. Once you fill up these Rosowski cracks, now you have turnaround and you, what you start to see then is the massive amounts of volumetric expansion which goes on in the c-axis direction. So <clears throat> it was a quite a clever explanation. It came primarily out of England and the UK uh, back in the past. And this has been a, the model that most people uh, believe is happening. Why do we believe it's happening? Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's because of this. So this is a short video showing radiation under a high resolution TEM. This is just electron damage. What you see here, this little lenticular crack is what we saw uh, previously. And as you can see, under a re continued radiation from electrons, it's closing the crack. So it's, it's not, this isn't new. This is just one of the, the better movies I've been able to find out there. We've done this in the past and we've seen this to at least qualitatively verify what we're seeing here. And at the end, if I had let this, this movie completely play out, it would be a pretty messy right there where the, the, the crack was, but it was definitely much more uh, closed. So again, kind of an interesting concept to see that the, the, um, the model is actually working the way we think it is. The problem is, is we don't see a lot of subplanes. The problem is, is that we see um, um, other types of defects. This was a defect that was predicted you know, a couple of decades ago by Malcolm Heggie. And it's called the buckle, ruck, and tuck, where you actually have the dislocations pinned in a certain area. And what they do is you stack up enough dislocations inside there, and then they can actually twist and warp the, the, the basal planes, and they form this kink, which is the buckling of the basal plane, and then it rucks and tucks by going in and expanding. And we were sort of despairing because we didn't really see this for a while, uh, evidence of it, but until very recently, in the last few years, uh, this is some good work from Dr. Steve Johns from Boise State University. And as you can see with this defect, you can see that there's a quite a large expansion in the C-axis direction. And with enough of these, you can actually start to see without uh, subplane formation, with enough of these, you can actually start to see why the C-axis could expand in this area as well. All right, let's move on to why graphite does not burn. So this is, this is just a little movie to, to show you just um, as, as a, like I said, a qualitative movie. This is about uh, 900 degrees Celsius, I believe. Um, you can see it immediately cooling. 
we then hooked it up to a thermal couple. And the thermal couple basically sits there and shows you that there is no burning, a self-sustained oxidation. There is just immediate cooling. And the graphite will sit there and just um, cool down to room temperature within a matter of minutes. Now I'm gonna try, oh, that's not gonna happen. I'm having trouble with my, anyway, we'll go ahead. What, what we did was we showed also the fact that the air was, um, we put air on it, in case we were depriving it of air. Uh, all that did effectively was to cool it down faster. We put it on top of an insulating plate and it just made it cool down slower. So as you can see, there's just no way we can go in and have the uh, sample have a self-sustain. Maybe it's a size effect, we would say. Maybe with a small sample, we just don't have enough material to retain enough heat to keep the oxidation uh, going and sustain it. Well, this is a very short clip of graphite fabrication. Uh, it's just come out of Asheron Furnace. It's basically um, 3000 degrees Celsius. This is all done in air. What it's showing is they slid it out of the, of the furnace and they're just taking these billets and rolling them off the uh, tracks uh, that they were in, in the furnace on. There's, as you can see, it's already cooling at the top <clears throat> and they're doing everything in air. But there's obviously no real concern from the fabricators because they know all they have to do is roll it off and the, uh, the graphite billets will um, cool by themselves with, with minimal oxidation. Now, I will say this, it is oxidizing. You just can't see it because it's COCO2. But again, only the outer reactive surface area sites are going to react, which limits the reaction, right? Next is, is uh, fires and explosions, all right? So we've talked about fires, let's talk about explosions. Can graphite dust explode? It's a big issue if you're going in and trying to figure out if the uh, graphite dust you generate, if you're gonna go in and di dismantle a graphite core uh, will explode. Now this is corn or maize dust. And everybody understands that corn dust or maize dust will actually explode. And you can see this, the initial flash was the ignition, but you can see the rolling fireball through the, um, the tubes there showing that the, graph, the, the maize dust actually does ignite and sustain and there is an explosion from it. Now graphite, you'll see an initial spark or explosion, but there's nothing. What happens is that you can see that there was a little bit, and that was all the readily available reactive surface area um, sites oxidizing. But as soon as they were gone, it basically put itself out. So there is no real graphite fires and explosions that are possible simply because it puts itself and, and cannot sustain the chemical reaction. All right, so that's what I have today. I just wanted to put in a plug for Dr. Nidia Diego. She'll basically be, um, she'll basically be giving a presentation on molten salt issues inside of graphite, with graphite uh, at the end of May. And so I know that there was a, a bit of a plug for that, but I just wanted to make sure that you had an understanding of what um, uh, Dr. Uh, Nidia Gago is gonna be doing in a month or so. So in summary, graphite's important, obviously, for these uh, future Gen 4 designs, but also carbon-based materials, uh, ceramic composites, and even ceramics. Again, because of these new designs that are, we have these new material systems. We still have a lot of work uh, remaining characterizing the nuclear graphite, uh, chronic oxidation behaviors, uh, irradiation, molten salt, which you'll talk about in a month or so, and then any of the other new coolants and fuel systems for these reactive designs. And that concludes my discussion. Thank you, Dr. Lines. I'm going to switch back. Um, 
I can here to give you a look <clears throat> at the upcoming webinar presentations. In May, a presentation on the graphite molten salt interactions, as um, Dr. Wines just indicated. In June, a panel discussion on the international <clears throat> excuse me, knowledge management and preservation of SF SFR. And in July, a presentation on off-gas xenon detection and management in support of MSRs. Before we start into the Q&A today, we do want to give you um, a heads up and discussion about the Pitch Your Gen 4 research competition. Patricia? Yes. <clears throat> do you hear me better? Yes, ma'am. It was not working good. Um, we have launched the GIF Education and Training Working Group has launched uh, in December 2023 a worldwide competition um, and we were asking uh, junior scientists, PhD, postdoc um, to compete, uh, submitting an abstract. The jury has uh, selected 11 um, candidates who present, who have prepared outstanding videos. Um, you have here the uh, two links on YouTube and Bilibili platform for our colleagues in China. Uh, I'm inviting you uh, on behalf of the Education and Training Working Group to watch these videos. They are three minutes long, and um, we are calling that um, the public vote, which means that the person you like, please click like. We will count at the end of this month the number of likes, and the one who has the highest number will be selected to present a webinar in 2024. I think this is a, a very good opportunity to spread the word out about Gen4, an international forum about advanced reactor system and cross-cutting subject that support this advanced reactor system. So spread the word out, um, send uh, uh, this, this postcard that you have in, in, your, uh, in the attached files to your colleagues, to juniors, to the young ones who do not know really what they want to do in life, but they are interested by STEM. And, and thank you again for your support. Thank you, Berta. Back to you. Thank you, Patricia. So while well, we do have several questions, um, I'll start with the three-part question. The first of that three-part reads, how do you control the graphite porosity during the fabrication process? Does the pore size affect the graphite behavior? And lastly, does the porosity affect the thermal stability of the graphite? Okay, that's an excellent question, really good. So the pore structure is, first of all, controlled by the selection of the size of the coke particles. So as you can imagine, if you use um, coke particles that are a millimeter in, in diameter, the interstitial between, say, three or four of those stacked together is going to give you something like a 350 to 400 micron interstitial space between them, just stacking spheres together. If you had one micron, that would be 350 to 400 nanometers. So that's the first way to do it. The second way to do it is to go in, you are gluing them all back together again. And so your uh, pitch is a liquid pitch. And what you can do is when you um, glue it together with the, the liquid pitch and then you bake it, uh, of course, it will then form these, what we call gas entrainment pores. You can go back and re-impregnate uh, it with liquid pitch and fill in some of those pores and do this successive times until you have a density and a pore structure that you want. So that's the first one. The second, uh, question, part of this question, the absolutely, the pores actually dictate uh, for the most part every material property in, in nuclear graphite and basically any kind of synthetic graphite that has porosity like that. So you're absolutely correct. The, the, the pores can uh, affect the strength, the fracture toughness, um, everything from the uh, modulus to the, even uh, to some extent, the 
the chemical, or excuse me, the uh, chemical reactivity and the oxidation. Um, and last but not least, and you'll hear this from uh, the excellent work from Dr. Nydia Gallego, uh, molten salt intrusion into the graphite uh, microstructure, the possibility that molten salt would actually go into the pores. And, and, and Bert, could you repeat the, the third? Yeah, lastly, does the porosity affect the thermal stability of graphite? Ah, yes, it does. Like every refractory material, basically you want the, a little forgiveness in the massive thermal expansion uh, for, the, uh, for, for very high temperatures. So much like your alumina or zirconia bricks that you put in and lying into your, your furnaces, which are nice and lightweight and porous, graphite porosity also provides that kind of forgiveness as well. Thank you. Thank you. Fundamentally, Fundamentally air, air and leakage, leakage or impurities or in the coolant, coolant, coolant can dramatically, dramatically impact graphite impact thermal. thermal. And I'm not sure I'm what not this, sure this, this is an abbreviation, and FP, FP tension properties in graphite in HTGRs. Can you describe what the countermeasures are made for or planned to prevent air leakage? Yeah. Impurities in HTGRs. Right. So, um, as anybody who's gone back and and even passing glanced at uh, previous gas cooled um, high temperature reactors, there is always air. There is always a little bit of water, and there's always these contaminants in there. And that is going to probably be uh, the case uh, for the for the future as well. And we could talk about this all day because there's this complicated chemistry about what the graphite takes out of the coolant. Uh, they would, it would literally react with the oxygen and the rest of the high temperature metallic systems requires that oxygen to, to keep their, their st thermal stability for their oxide scale on, on them. So there is this constant give and take that's going on. So the, the, the questioner is absolutely right. The, the chemistry is going to be extremely important. There is always going to be a little bit of oxidation that occurs because of this. Um, as a consequence, the system is, um, the graphite is going to oxidize. There's going to be some chronic oxidation that's going on. Most people try to keep the oxidation to a very bare minimum, simply to go in and keep the coolant at about a 50 to 75 ppm uh, level of oxygen or, or or water, and as a consequence, uh, what that will do then is um, consequently is have a very slow oxidation. But you're talking hundreds of metric uh, tons of graphite in some of these these reactors. For some of the small micro reactors, this may become more of a problem uh, if they were to be used for much much longer periods of time. Um, but as I said, you're not talking about a lot of oxidation that's going on. It will occur, uh, but in the end, uh, you're, you're relying upon the massive amount of, of, of graphite in your core to absorb any kind of small amount of oxygen that, that's possible in the, in the core system or the coolant system. Thank you. Nuclear grade graphite is key material for core components in different HTGR designs. What specific types of graphite are considered to be the most promising for HTGRs? Which of them are off the sh on the shelves products, ready for deployment, taking into account manufacturing readiness on a bigger scale? What is your opinion? Do you know what type of graphite for key core components is usual in the Xenon 100 or Xenon Energy? MMR, HT, RPM designs? I'm not familiar with those specific designs. <clears throat> as far as I know that, um, I, I, do, I do talk with um, most of the, of the uh, reactor, um, high temperature reactor designers using graphite um, and their suppliers. So there's a long laundry list of this. Um, the, Probably the best source uh, for this, a, a nice uh, consolidated source, is the Inagraph experiment that was performed at uh, under the EU. 
in the uh, 2000 teens. Uh, the, the list there is, is fairly comprehensive of the current grades of graphite. A lot of um, the uh, graphite grades that were tested both there as well as the United States and elsewhere are currently available. <clears throat> there are a few historical grades. So nobody's going to be using Gilsel carbon, which is uh, unfortunate. Uh, it's a good a good graphite, but uh, uh, the Gilsa carbon is a historical grade, much like the H451. Um, you've got the PGA sources, all of those are all old sources that most people aren't making uh, anymore. A lot of the extruded kinds of grades as well. So the current grades of graphite right now are probably going to be things such as the IG110. Uh, which the Japanese HTTR and the HTRPM, I believe, uh, utilized in their first core designs. Um, there's MBG-18, MBG-17 is, is a potential as well. Those have been, um, have not had a lot of, of manufacturing and processing, uh, maybe 10 to 12 uh, batches of it. And so, uh, but they are capable of producing this. SGL is capable of producing MBG 17 and 18 anytime you want them. Uh, same thing is true for the PCA grade, which is coming out of GraphTech, the 2114, which is coming out of Mersenne in 2020, uh, out, of, out of Mersenne as well. As you can see, there's many grades of graphite that are out there, they're worldwide. Uh, whether they're from China or Japan or the United States or the um, the EU, so there's 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 pretty much uh, the, the the grades of graphite that are out there are pretty well documented in the Intergraph and in the EGC reports. Uh, I do want to put in a plug for for Ibidem because they the ET10 grade that they are providing for Kairos is, is also one. The last thing I want to say in 30 seconds is that many of these grades of graphite have some irradiation, but many of them have little to no irradiation. That's probably the differentiation between an irradi or excuse me, a nuclear grade of graphite and a, and a non-nuclear grade of graphite is how much irradiation does it have? Like I said, you can put any grade of graphite you want into your reactor design and call it nuclear graphite, because it is. Um, but you have to have the understanding and the data to be able to justify what the behavior of that graphite is going to be. And that's the, probably the differentiation of what current grades of graphite and historical grades of graphite are, is how much irradiation data do we actually have on the graphite? So kind of a long ranging and, 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 and uh, diffuse answer, but it was a very broad question. Thank you. So I would expect that there is a surface area ratio above which combustion could be sustained. Has the value of that threshold either as a surface area to volume ratio or as a particle size been characterized? Uh, no, and nobody's really gotten down to that, but we've done actually, there's some, some really interesting uh, studies uh, looking from a modeling standpoint. And as soon as you get above about 50 to 60 atoms, uh, what you find is that the, 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 the graphite actually becomes naturally limiting. The RSA's um, uh, reactive surface area chemical um, uh, sites are where the, 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 the chemical reactivity actually begins. So the, the common thought is that anything above about 50, 60 atoms, and you start to already start to see self-limiting in the graphite. Um, so these are just, that's a single graphene plane. And so as a consequence, uh, anything above that, it's going to uh, continue to be self-limiting. And of course, as it gets more and more uh, larger, you're going to have fewer pathways for the oxidation. So, nothing that's gone in and looked at, you know, creating nanometer-sized particles and then um, trying to see if they will oxidize. But some of the um, atomistic models have shown that anything above about 50, 60 atoms, and you're going to, you're going to start to approach this self-limiting chemical reactivity. 
Thank you. You mentioned no nuclear graphite standard. What about ASTM D7219, which is mentioned in ASME BPD section three, division five? Yes, actually, that's a that's a good catch. So D7219 is a is a great um, um, standard. It gives the sort of the minimum requirements for a nuclear grade of graphite we needed something so that people didn't just pick anything and then find halfway through the design process that it wasn't going to work <clears throat> we tried to put a, the minimum uh, requirements on it but we made them so small or so minimal and so broad that it's not as as definitive as say like a 316 or a 316 l type which has a very prescribed chemistry and prescribed material properties. So, um, and then the other uh, aspect of it is that if you if you decide to use a grade of graphite that does not meet 7219, then the the licensing bodies are they don't they don't have to uh, have to to reject it. If you pick a grade of graphite that meets your design requirements and you can prove that it is effective and safe for the your particular design and operations and but it doesn't actually meet the d7219 uh, requirements and standard that's okay and so as a consequence d7219 is a great start you should look at it you should follow it you should understand what it's trying to tell you but if at some point you need something that's a little weaker than what the d7219 specifies then that's your prerogative, so long as you can show with your data that it is uh, safe in the safe on, uh, safe operating operation. Thank you. Thank you. Would you um, elaborate on the difference between graphite material used as a moderator and the graphite material used as a, a matrix in fuel compacts or pebbles? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so uh, what I'm talking about is uh, structural graphite. So, and the key point, and this is why I pointed it out, is the graphitization. You must expose the graphite component or the bulk material to over 2000 um, degrees Celsius before it will actually start to graphitize. And as I said, most people for the structural graphite will heat treat it to 3000. The fuel matrix material, uses graphite particles but the phenolic resin that glues it all back together again because they don't want to damage the fuel particles they'll only go in and and bake out the fuel compacts or fuel pebbles to 1617 or 1800 degrees celsius so it doesn't actually quite reach that graphitization temperature nor do they hold it long enough to for, to form any kind of uh, new graphitic uh, structures so it's it's that graphitization temperature and holding it for long enough to form the graphite structure, which is the key difference between fuel matrix material and structural graphite. Thank you. Would graphite interact with sodium in any way? Um, I'm going to punt on that. I don't know. Um, I'm not a, a chemical uh, engineer, so that's a question that I would have to defer to a, a chemical uh, reactivity scientist. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the influence of generated carbon-14 by the neutron irradiation of graphite? How do you treat graphite waste containing carbon-14? Wow, um, that's a very broad question. Yeah, carbon-14 generation, uh, there's the debate, the eternal debate, whether it comes from activation of graphite atoms or whether it's a nitrogen uh, activation process. Uh, either way, it doesn't matter. There's carbon-14 that's in there in the waste, and as a consequence, it needs to be understood and, and, and safely disposed of. There's quite a few people out there that have uh, excellent uh, ideas and um, and and research 
the carbo waste group that was working in the EU primarily um, with uh, in the early, excuse me, the late 2000s and the early 2010s, um, produced some excellent reports and some some very good understanding of what is necessary to 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 deal with and sequester and dispose safely of the of the carbon 14. I know there's also a lot of work that's going on specifically for those people who have the Magnox and the AGR reactors to try to go in and capture a lot of this um, problems as they, uh, the carbon 14 and other types of contaminants as they try to figure out how to dispose of these uh, graphite structural components safely. So um, I know there's some significant work that's being done. And last but not least, the United States has come late to the game, but we have very recently in the last six months started the process of understanding what our requirements, our specific USA requirements are for this, whether we can treat this as a low level waste, whether it can be treated as a, can, should be treated as a contaminated waste, if there's molten salt or fuel inside there, what are the actual uh, levels of waste stream the, uh, and, and, the, and the safe considerations when you dispose of it. So it's a very broad question and it's a, it's an exact, a, a, a very impertinent and, and important question, but uh, a good first start would be to go back to the carbon waste and, and uh, understand what they did because the work that uh, was done 10 years ago was truly excellent in this area. Thank you. Follow up to the fuel matrix graphite. How is the behavior different than the structural fully graphitized graphite? Yeah. Another good question. All right, so it's because it's baked and not graphitized, it's a little harder um, for the most part. So um, if you take the, say, a pebble, a uh, fuel pebble, you bounce it on the ground, it'll bounce. It'll bounce back. It's, a, it's almost a completely elastic uh, response. As a consequence, it's uh, if you took a, a similarly uh, massed and, and dimensioned sphere of graphite, it would not bounce. It would basically thud on the ground, and and so those that's the one of the main differences. It's stronger, harder, and it could potentially have a wear issue. That's something that that needs to be looked at. The other thing that's interesting is because it's been uh, hasn't been graphitized completely. What you see is that its dimensional changes that we talked about can actually uh, accelerate. The turnaround is uh, dose is much lower than say structural graphite. Uh, not too much of a problem because it's not expected because it's fuel and the fuel will burn up. It's not expected to be in the reactor for nearly as long as the structural graphite. But um, its dimensional changes are different and they can actually be a little worse than the structural graphite. And finally, the oxidation is a little bit faster than the uh, structural grade of uh, structural graphite. Um, we've got some recent studies that are coming out uh, from the INL as well as um, other places around the world that are looking at the new um, fuel matrix material and the oxidation. And what we're seeing is that there is a slight acceleration in the oxidation rate from this. Thank you. Fatigue of graphite is fairly unknown and there's been advances to incorporate it. In the ASME code, any questions or comments on what some obstacles to understand fatigue and how we could close that gap? Yeah, the, yeah the, uh, the, the biggest obstacle is how does the ASME create generic code that is applicable for all designs? Fatigue, as most of you folks would know, is going to be, you know, the level of fatigue, the, the, the frequency, the cycles of the fatigue are going to be very design dependent. Um, so as a consequence, it's very difficult for the ASME, which is a generic 
best practices code rules to simply state well you must do all designs must um, look at fatigue in this way or this manner and answer these kinds of questions in fatigue um, right now it's 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 broadly written if, if you want to describe that it's probably a couple of sentences only that says that each designer must address potential fatigue issues uh, is what it says boiled down in its context which is probably appropriate right now simply because we don't have a good understanding of what the fatigue issues are for the current uh, new batches of reactors. So as a consequence, when we get that um, new operating experience and there is uh, um, issues that are universal throughout this, this uh, graphite core component use, then we can start to put that into the code. But right now, um, nobody has any real practical experience I know the UK and the Magnox folks and some of these other um, graphite cord reactor designs have this operating experience, but those are dramatically different specifically because of the radiolytic oxidation. Um, and so as a consequence, you can't quite go in and write that into the new code because we don't know uh, if all of these new reactor designs are going to have the same kind of operating experience. So it's very difficult to, to close that gap without real operating experience to go in and understand what generically is going to be useful for all uh, graphite core reactor designs for these new HTRs. Thank you. What a great round of questions. I knew that the webinar presentation would be worth our little bit of delay getting started this morning. And again, I apologize for that delay. But thank you so much, Dr. Wines, for sharing your expertise with us. Now, that's all the questions that I see coming in. Uh, Patricia, do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, yes, I would like to thank again uh, Will uh, for his wonderful knowledge and sharing that with us. Um, as always, and, and Berta, we always see that over the months and the years, the Q&A session, it's, it's really the highlight of all of that. Thank you so much to the audience for participating and asking questions. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you again, Will. Thank you. I very well, much we appreciate the opportunity. There, I did see one last um, clarification come in. To clarify for the audience, the fuel matrix graphite material is mostly natural flake graphite with some synthetic graphite and phenolic resin, but the synthetic graphite material powder is fully graphitized. That is correct. Yeah, so the, the structural graphite, not, not the fuel compact or the fuel matrix, that is fully graphitized. The and it's it's the it's remember it's the glue the phenolic resin that we're graphitizing. So uh, natural flake and synthetic particles that are added into the fuel matrix material, they are still bound together along with the fuel particles. Of course, they're still bound together with this phenolic resin, which must be graphitized to give the whole components uh, graphitized um, behavior. Great. It's great to have such knowledgeable people participating on both the presentation side and the audience side. It's wonderful to have that, that back and forth. Thank you very much. Gil, again, Dr. Wines, thank you. And I apologize again for the bit of delay um, and the, the little bit of technical issues that we had this morning. No problem. With that, I think I'll return everyone to the rest of their day. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again on a future webinar. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.